James Reston Jr. is a senior scholar with the Wilson Center and is also a prolific author. Today he joins us to discuss his latest book, Luther's Fortress, Martin Luther and His Reformation Under Siege. And Jim, this is number 17? I think that's right. In a list that includes topics as uh, divergent as Pete Rose and Galileo. I like the range. <laughs> well, let me ask you about that first before we talk about Luther's yeah. Fortress. What's your process for picking a subject? Well, it, it changes every time, of course. This particular book emerges from a book I published in 2008 called Defenders of the Faith that focused on the years 1520 to 1536. And you had Henry VIII and Francis I and Medici popes and Suleiman the Magnificent in Istanbul, so a time of giants. Mm -hmm. But in the middle of that was Martin Luther. And I have to say, I was just smitten by the, enamored Luther, with the, character. With yeah. the Luther story. And particularly this 10 months that I cover in, in Luther's Fortress, you know, which I think is so intense and interesting. So, yeah, and, and so the title is not metaphorical. You're talking about an actual fortress. Yes. Tell us about that and how Martin Luther came to be there. Well, he is in, uh, of course, it starts with the 95 theses that are uh, tapped up in the year. Uh, 1517, and we're now in 1520, 21, and he's excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church, and he is summoned to a place on the Rhine River called Worms or Worms mm -hmm. to uh, account for his heresy. And um, so he makes his journey. He uh, has this bravura performance before the Holy Roman Emperor who is horrified by the performance. And out of that conclave, Luther is also banned by the, the secular authority. So he is subject to be uh, seized and taken to the Inquisition and burned at the stake. I mean, this is uh, the uh, time they the, did the that. The Salman Rushdie of his day. <clears throat> yes. And um, so it is friendly forces concoct this conspiracy to grab him on his way home and take him secretly to a castle called, called the Wartburg. And so mm -hmm. that's the fortress. And he spends is eight months there? Ten. Ten months. So what makes this ten months so critical in the story of Martin Luther and the Reformation? Well, uh, it's critical in a number of ways. Um, to begin with, his, this is very much a fragile um, political movement at the time. And so um, he, the downside for him to be in absentia from Wittenberg, this, the core of this rebellion, uh, is that it's taken over by fanatics, basically, in his absence. So one problem he has is how to keep this, this movement un, into control when he's, when he's absent. Um, secondarily, he is enormously prolific during this period. Uh, I have mined the letters. He writes letters almost every day. And in that period, he, I think, crystallizes his theology, uh, and w which is very much an attack on the central, some central tenets of, the, of Roman Catholic theology. But perhaps most traumatic of all is that he translates the New Testament of the Bible from the uh, Latin Vulgate into, uh, into the, the, the speech of the man on the street in Germany. In 27 weeks. In 27 weeks. Which is remarkable. Um, it's, uh, well, it's actually 10 weeks in 27 books is where we're at up, okay. upside. And, and 10 that, weeks. In, in 10 weeks, that's right, December through, through March. So this is an extraordinary act of genius, number one. But it's also an act which, which creates basically the standard for high German from that point forward. So, so this is a great literary achievement. He also looks into his sexuality uh, out of Martin Luther's attitude towards his own sexuality and celibacy in particular. He proclaims that, the, um, that celibacy is the work of the devil, that it leads priests into insincerity and into abuse. A very modern, Pressing. a very modern subject all altogether, and he struggles with his with his uh, with his concern about the devil and evil in the world, and to, and for Luther, you know, the devil is a very tangible, immediate figure, and he feels that 
unless you really believe deeply in the forces of evil and the devil per se, that your belief in uh, Jesus Christ is less. If, if he had perished or had been permanently removed from the movement, is this the difference between uh, something that was transformational for Western civilization versus a historical footnote? Oh, I think absolutely it is. Uh, I mean, he was the spiritual leader, the intellectual leader, uh, the political leader, and um, had it not been for him, who knows w what would have happened so far as the reformation, for, so far as a reformation is concerned. So, um, so this is uh, uh, this is critical. The fact that he. Um, survives this period. I mean, he's beset by all kinds of psychological problems and physical problems. He could very well have died during this, this period. He could very well have been seized by the authorities and burned at the stake. And uh, fanatics take over his movement, and it would have been absolutely been a footnote in, in history. So, yes, I believe it was transformational. Two uh, major uh, themes that emerged for me. Uh, that I'd like you to comment on then here if there's another you'd like to tell yeah. us about as the author. One is, this is a story about the power of focus in many ways, especially in an age of continual partial attention. Yeah. Looking back, this man alone in isolation for this period of time and these remarkable moments and achievements occur, intellectual yeah. achievements occur. Is that one of the things that you see as part of the story? Well, to be... To be absolutely honest, that was the great challenge to me from a literary standpoint of how to make a, write an exciting book about a guy who's sitting in a cell for 10 months, you yes. know, basically. <laughs> but so the excitement of it is the pressure that he's under and the what ifs of the thing, which we've just discussed. Um, but also what happens when a genius and a great spiritual leader like this is forced into solitude. Mm -hmm. um, what happens? Does does he go crazy, or um, you know, is his movement shattered uh, in in his absence? Uh, what does he do? Well, the the um, prolific um, production of Luther during this period, letters and sermons and essays and um, and this translation of the Bible is absolutely extraordinary. The other, the other theme that, that strikes me as part of the story is the, the impact one person can have in history. That uh, we often think in terms of the, the conundrum of whether the person makes history or history makes the person. Right. You've made quite a case with this book that one person had a significant impact on history. Yes. Um, well, as you may know, I, I did a, a biography of Galileo back mm -hmm. in, the, in the 1990s. And I used to say with that book that in the life of Galileo, you really had the dividing line between ancient history and modern history. I think something can something of the same sort of thing could be said about Luther and and this particular moment, because this these ten months I would argue are really the birth of authentic Protestantism, and of course, um, you know the Protestant Protestantism versus Catholicism is a. Um, is where the dividing line is between how, how one, if you're a, a devout Christian, chooses to worship God. Uh, so, so, yes, uh, this stands, I think, in, in, um, in very distinct contrast to Henry VIII, for example. Here we are in America, and it's kind of thought with the Anglican tradition that Protestantism begins with Henry VIII. Not at all, not the authentic side, because Luther's protest was against the abuses of the church and against certain uh, tenets of the, of the Catholic dogma that he disputed. Um, Henry VIII's protest was about succession and lust for, for Anne Boleyn, and it was not, I think, um, where authentic Protestantism begins. So. So, yes, it's absolutely a turning point. Well, Jim, congratulations on yet another piece of outstanding work. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to the next one, and thanks for joining us and talking about Luther's Fortress. Thank you, John.